Hello. We're so glad you've chosen to join us for this worship time at Cokie Baptist Church in Appland, Georgia. God is doing something in our midst, and we are excited that you're a part of it. For information about our live services, other activities, or general information, please go to kaoki.org. If you'd like to support the ministry of Koki financially, you can give securely on our website. In just a few minutes, we'll open our Bibles to read and hear God's message. But right now, let's sing together in worship of Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. good to be with you again. Uh, today we are going to be uh, looking at an event in the life of Jesus. And so as we get started, I want to make a, I want to proposition you with this. I'd like to invite you to dinner. Confession, I love to eat. I love to eat with anybody, but especially with people that I care about. 
It was one of the things that drew me to Susan when we began to date. Uh, it dawned on me, this girl actually eats and she seems to enjoy it. Well, Jesus liked to eat with anybody, be it in feeding 5,000 people or going to a party with sinners at the house of Matthew, the tax collector. One of the things about having Jesus for dinner or eating with him was everyone in the room is measured by their proximity to him. In other words, everyone is in some way in relationship to Jesus or with Jesus, either intimately or from afar, or sometimes, as we're going to see in one case today, be it in opposition to him. But the, the thing I want you to sew down on is this. The defining statement of your life is, what is your relationship to Jesus Christ? Because love him or hate him, despise him or adore him, Jesus makes all the difference. Today, that's the title of the message, All the Difference. And one of the great examples of this truth that Christ makes all the difference in my life and in your life is found at a dinner given in his honor. Now, before we turn to the text, I want to give you a little bit of background. In the Gospel of John, chapter 11, Jesus' good friend, Lazarus, gets sick. Jesus is notified and is asked, requested, to come to Lazarus with the hopes of healing him. Well, Jesus intentionally delays, and when he arrives in Bethany, Lazarus has been dead for four days. So, let me just uh, read kind of the situation leading up to this dinner that, um, that Jesus is at in chapter 12. So in John 11, verse 43, it tells, John tells us that when Jesus had said these things in response to Martha, his sister, Mary, his sister, to the crowd, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And then John tells us in the very next verse, the man, Lazarus, who had died, came out. His hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. So there's the miracle. Jesus raises his good friend, Lazarus, who has been dead, Earlier, John ex describes the tomb as being a cave for four days. Now, next we see two responses to what Jesus has done. In verse 45, still in chapter 11, we read, Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. So there's one response. There is a belief in Christ. Now, verse 46 tells us the second response. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So instead of looking at what the Lord has done, one group who has believed in Him, the other group says, I'm going to go narc. I'm going to go tattletale. I've got to let the priest know. Now, maybe some of them were legitimate and they were just excited and, and wanted the priest to know. It's not the inclination you get, whether that's fair or unfair. Now, next we see the response of the religious leaders to what Jesus has done. Upon being told, they get together for a meeting. And in verse 53... We read, so from that day on, they, the religious leaders, made plans to put him, Jesus, to death. So, as I said, 
Everybody lives in direct proximity to Christ. Everybody is in relationship with Him. Those that believed in Him, those that saw what He did and went and had to tell others, and then the religious leaders, in, in choosing to put Him to death, they are in relationship with Him. They don't realize they are right smack dab in the middle of the plan of God. They think they're pulling the strings, and they've got the power, but they've decided to kill him. So, with that as the background, chapter 12, verse 1, again, John writes, six days before the Passover, let me call a timeout. We're not certain exactly how, how much time has elapsed since Jesus' raising of Lazarus. Evidently, it has not been all that long. So, six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why is this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Now, here's the situation. There are at least 15 people reclining at the, ta- at the dinner table. Now, I say reclining because um, in the ancient Middle East, and actually in many cases still today, You didn't sit upright at a dinner table and uh, use your utensils. You rather leaned in on the table. You reclined uh, on your right elbow, and your feet would stick back away from the table. So there's Jesus, who is the guest of honor at this dinner, There is Lazarus, who is, uh, as John reminds us a couple of times, whom Jesus brought back from the dead, and now he's eating supper. There are the twelve disciples, unaware that Jesus is less than a week from the cross. This is the reference to the Passover. This is uh, is Jesus' final week before his crucifixion. Then there's another man who goes unnamed in John's account of this dinner, but he is very prominent in both Matthew and Mark's account. There's not a whole lot of difference between the three accounts. Um, In Matthew 26 and in Mark 14, the setting is the same, Uh, but we're told that the dinner is actually given not at the home of Lazarus, but at the home of a man named Simon the leper. Now, I think it's safe to assume that Simon was no longer a leper. Lepers did not mix uh, publicly with with non-lepers. Most commentators believe that he bore the title, the name Simon the leper, because he had been healed by Jesus. And that was the, the new reference point of his life. Remember, everybody stands in relationship with Jesus. 
either before you bow before him or after you bow before him. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2 assures us that everybody will bow before Jesus and confess with their mouth that he is the Lord. So Simon, I think it's a safe, safe assumption, a safe bet that he had already done that. Now, also at the dinner, uh, but probably not at the table, were Lazarus' two sisters, referenced here in John's account, Martha and Mary. Martha was um, the sister of Lazarus, and as well as, as, well as Mary. We're going to get into a little bit more detail on both of them shortly. And finally, gathered outside, but evidently, able to look inside, maybe through an opening, what we would think of as a window opening, um, was a crowd of people, along with some religious figures. So what I want us to do, the, the balance of our time, is just answer the question, how does Jesus make all the difference? How did he make all the difference in these people's lives, and how does he make all the difference in your life and mind. I think there's six ways or six examples, certainly, that we see in, uh, at this dinner. So let's get started and let's look at them. First, first way Jesus makes all the difference is he gives status to the rejected. Jesus gives status to the re rejected. Those that are living on the outside of the acceptable crowd. I think you probably know who I'm referencing. It's the one that John actually doesn't, but Matthew and Mark do, and that is Simon, a leper. Think about his situation. Uh, leprosy was and is a horrible disease that affected a person in several different ways. It, it affects it affects you physically. You lose feeling in, in your extremities. There often develops all over your body scabs, wounds from not being able to feel, bumping into things. Your skin often dries up. And also, it is, was not unusual for, as the disease progressed, for your digits, your fingers and your toes to be lost. It's horrible. It's horrible. But it also affected a person emotionally because you literally became, you, you basically lost your personhood. Whether you were incredibly successful in your life up to that point uh, or not, you were immediately upon discovery of the disease, you were rejected. Culturally, religiously, you would be kicked out of the, of the synagogue. You were rejected publicly. You would lose your family, for you had to live outside of town. It was an incredible stain upon your family, and it was a stain upon who you were. That would have been the life of Simon the leper. Can you imagine sitting around that table, reclining around that table, if Simon sitting next to Lazarus, the conversation that took place between those two men, you can just almost hear Simon speaking to Lazarus and just describing what life had been like. I, Lazarus, I had no one. I had no thing. I was a total outcast. And then the most amazing thing happened. Jesus found me. And he didn't just find me, Lazarus. He spoke to me. And then he did something that had not happened to me since the day I contracted the disease. He reached out and he touched me. And immediately... I was restored. I was healed. The scabs were gone. 
my eyes could see. I was whole. I was whole. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Whether you have been disenfranchised because of something in your past, an action you've committed, maybe some really poor choices in your life that have brought you to the point of sensing and feeling like a a reject. Maybe you have very few friends, if any. I want you to know that Jesus is still reaching out to those that have been rejected. And here's, here's the thing. The way He gives you status is He calls you mine. You become His. When the relationship you have with Christ goes from being an outsider, from being uh, uh, someone that nobody really gives a flip about, and you surrender your life to Christ, you become His. The Bible tells us that we become a part of His family. Jesus becomes our brother. God becomes our Father. So, Jesus gives status to the rejected. Here's the second way He makes all the difference. Uh, He gives life to the dead. Jesus gives life to the dead. Well, still sitting around that table and, and listening to that conversation between Simon and Lazarus, upon hearing his story, Lazarus, perhaps, would, uh, would respond, well, Simon, that's amazing. That is an incredible story. Very cool. But let me tell you, I got you beat <laughs> because I was dead. I was dead. I had been dead for four days in a cave. I actually was with the Father. I was in heaven. I was praising and worshiping the Father. When all of a sudden, I hear the sweetest voice, the voice of my greatest friend, my Lord, my Savior. And maybe he points to the head of the table and says, Simon, it was his voice. It was the voice of Jesus. And he calls for me to come forth. And suddenly I'm back in the tomb, but this time I'm alive. Jesus gives life to the dead. Now, there is a metaphor here. Uh, It wasn't metaphorical for Lazarus. He had physically been dead and he had been brought back to life. But for those, the Bible tells us that we all are spiritually dead. The Apostle Paul describes it in his letter to the church in Ephesus that we are We're dead in our trespasses and sins. It is a place of being incapable and unable to save ourselves. We are without hope. But when you come to Christ, He changes everything. And He makes those that are spiritually not just sick, not just ill, not just desperate, but spiritually dead, He gives life. He gives life. And some of you think that your problem of why you feel out of relationship with God, out of relationship with the Lord, is because you haven't been religious enough, or you haven't tried hard enough, or you haven't worked hard enough. And you don't understand that the problem is you are spiritually dead, and you need life. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. Okay. Moving on. Not only 
does, um, does Jesus give life to the dead, but he gives purpose to the busy. He gives purpose to the busy. I want you to notice that John tells us that in verse 2, that as they gave a dinner for the Lord there, that Martha served and that Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. We've looked at Lazarus. Let's take just a moment to look at Martha. Here's Martha serving Jesus. Evidently, serving was in this lady's wheelhouse. Uh, You may remember that in Luke's Gospel, in Luke chapter 10, I'm just going to have a quick look at um, our first introduction to Martha and actually her sister Mary. Luke tells us that in, in, in verse 38 of chapter 10, now as they went on their way, that's the disciples, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. She went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Now, the the issue in Luke, in this first encounter, which probably took place about six months before the 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 raising of Lazarus, before this dinner, um, she's still serving, but the difference is she's no longer complaining. She's no longer griping. She's at peace with where she is. And I I just, I I can't help but wonder that that encounter, that first encounter, would not have been their first encounter in their lives, but in Scripture, in Luke, is that um, she realizes it's okay to be different than my sister Mary, and it's okay for her to be different than me, and Lazarus to be different than me, and the disciples to be different than me. I'm a servant. I love to serve And I particularly love to serve you, Lord. Now listen, Jesus takes what you do and he uses it for his purposes and for his glory. In that way, he'll make all the difference in your life. Those things that you feel wired to do, those things that you just kind of draw a special energy in doing, He will take those things and He will magnify them as you magnify Him in doing it. Okay. The fourth way Jesus makes all the difference. And it's going to go now from being positive to being not so. And that's this. Jesus, Jesus exposes the phony. He exposes the phony. It seems like you're at this dinner... All is going well. Mary, Lazarus and Martha's sister, has in verse 3, breaks out uh, an expensive ointment, John tells us. It actually was nard. And he anoints, she anoints Jesus' feet. Again, Matthew and Mark tell us, tells us that not only did she anoint his feet, but she anointed his head as well. And uh, D.A. Carson in his commentary on this passage describes that probably it, the way the, the, this would have been in liquid form, that it would have just fallen down from his head over his body and down to his feet. And then she would have personally taken it and applied it to his feet. And then she takes her hair and she, and she caresses in a very respectful way drying this ointment into his head and into his feet. It must have been a profound moment in the life of all those reclining at the table, except, except for Judas. Because Judas, upon seeing this very uh, unselfish act of Mary, he speaks up. In verse 4, John tells us that But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? 
Now John it tells us in, in the midst of Judas' response and questioning of the Lord that it was phony. It was phony. It wasn't real. When he describes Judas as a thief, that word is the Greek word kleptes, which we get our word klepto, klep, kleptomaniac. It was described someone who planned out in advance to take what was not rightfully theirs. It's fascinating because these are the first words in the Scripture in terms of just the, the, uh, the sequential description of the Gospels up to this point. It's the first words that Judas Iscariot, we, we read of him speaking. And these words on the surface might look, oh, wow, Judas cares about the poor. But John makes sure that we know he didn't care about the poor. He did not care. He, he cared about himself. Um, in the New Testament, whenever the four gospel writers reference Judas, they always mention two things about him. Anytime you see a reference to Judas... One is that he was one of the disciples. And secondly, it was that he was the one that betrayed Jesus. His act of treachery would always be identified with him. I mean, if, you, if you today reference someone as a Judas, you are, in essence, calling them a backstabber. John tells us that he was, he was a traitor, he was a disciple, and uh, he tells us that he was a thief. Judas sees something that is very good and very right, and he sees it as a waste. Or at least, that's what he voices. He saw it as a waste because he probably... Just reading John's words and description, he could have, he's thinking, I could have used some of this money. Someone has described Judas as having a bitter view of life because he had a bitter heart. Another has said, when a man sees with, what a man sees with his eyes is a reflection of his heart. Can I tell you, if, um, if you really like an individual have you ever known have you ever noticed that if you like someone that person can do no wrong in your eyes it takes a lot for you to think negative of that individual but if 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 there's somebody that you don't care for it's like they can never do anything right you even see when they do do good works you're in your mind accusing them of having ulterior motives that seems to be the way Judas was wired. He was a phony. He was a phony. He's not the only person associated with Jesus. He's the only one of the twelve, but there are others that claim to be disciples, followers of Jesus, but are just not. Now we know Judas is what's going to happen to him in the next few days few days within this next week but if you just look at the man you realize that here was someone he said the right things but inside he was wicked he was corrupt there was a selfishness behind his words he was a critic he was a critic of others what should never be lost on you and me is that no matter how hard we try to develop this persona around ourselves, uh, no matter how good we are at pulling the wool over the eyes of others, when we're, when we're corrupt inside, God sees it. God knows it. And eventually we will stand before Him and give answer to that. That reality was too much for Judas. That's why he committed suicide. He thought he would end what he knew to be true, that 
the relationship he had with Jesus had been built on a lie. And the Lord had called him out on it. And it was too great a weight to bear. And by that time, it was over. Don't find yourself in that position. You, 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 listen, you could be the biggest phony around, but, but you stand in relationship with God regardless. Would you repent of that phoniness and come and trust Christ? Okay. Jesus, Jesus deals with all of us because we all stand in relationship to him. So the fifth way that he makes all the difference is that he elicits the curious and the angry. Jesus elicits the curious and the angry. We had said, as we read in verses 9 through 11, that there's a crowd gathered around the opening of the house. It appears that they're looking inside at Jesus and, and this is important, at Lazarus. They're in awe, maybe of the spectacle that that's the guy that had been dead for four days. And now he is sitting around, reclining at the table and eating with Jesus. And then there are the religious leaders, the chief priests, described in verse 10 as those that made plans. Not only have already decided to put Jesus to death, but then John tells us the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Jesus elicits a response from all of us, even those that dabble on the fringes, the curious, as well as those that are angry at him. And listen, you can be angry at him because you get uncomfortable when somebody begins to speak to you about Jesus, or you, uh, you maybe have, have never come to grips with certain things in your life and you hold yourself or you hold your possessions or you hold sometimes it's your family it can be good things that you hold so close to your heart that they block the person of Jesus Christ well eventually you will give an answer to those things and in standing at the fringes, you are responding because everybody stands in proximity to Christ. Okay, finally, the sixth thing, sixth way that Jesus makes all the difference is that he affirms the worshiper. He affirms the worshiper. And, um, and I just want to spend just a few minutes talking about Mary. John tells us that she breaks out this ointment. And um, this was no inexpensive. This was not like the uh, Kmart blue light special that's watered down to last an uh, extra long time that comes in a vat. And uh, they want to sell you for Christmas. Uh, this was something that John even explains in through... Laz, through Judas's words, his phony words, that, listen, this would have paid a worker's annual salary. In today's terms, the cost of this nard, this perfume, is estimated to be about $30,000. Now, one thing this tells us is perhaps Mary and Martha and Lazarus were somewhat wealthy. Or maybe this was an heirloom that had been passed down through the family and Mary decides if ever there was a time to break open this perfume, it's in the presence of the Master. It's in the presence of Jesus. Don't skip over. Jesus' words to Judas that are so affirming to Mary in verse 7. Jesus speaks and says, leave her alone. 
so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. First he says, stop it. And then he ascribes a purpose to Mary's act of worship that Mary, I think it's safe to say, probably is not aware of. That he's about to die. And remember, the gospel writers tell tell us that as the group of women go to the tomb that Sunday morning, they are going to anoint his body. But when they arrive, there's no body to There is no body to anoint. So if he's going to have his body anointed, this is going to be it. And Mary doesn't even realize the magnitude, the significance of this worshipful act. But Jesus does. Jesus does. It's an important reality for you and me to grasp. No genuine act of worship is ever lost on God. Ever. It is uh, fascinating to me that whenever Mary is mentioned in the Bible, you always find her at the feet of Jesus. In Luke 10, as we read earlier, that Luke describes Mary who sat at Jesus' feet and listened to his teaching. Earlier in John, in chapter 11, John tells us that now when Mary came to where Jesus was as he approaches uh, their home and saw him, She fell at his feet. There is something about the humility that Mary approaches Jesus with. And she has this willingness to learn and to soak in who he is. And I don't know, maybe maybe in your own mind, you might be thinking, well, you know, yeah, but she had the physical Jesus there. You have Jesus with you through the form, the person of the Holy Spirit. And so, be it early in the morning or late at night or any time in between, you have the opportunity to sit at the feet and listen to Jesus. When you open His Word, you are listening to the Word of Jesus. Paul says that all of Scripture is God-breathed. It's all inspired by the Lord Himself. Jesus affirms her. He affirms her worship. He affirms who she is. Okay. Let's close up. Let's close up. So here's the table. Here's the setting. And as you look at all the different people gathered either around the table, um, Martha, including Martha and Mary, who one is serving and one is worshiping, or the people, the crowd outside, you might be more like one than you are the other. Maybe you're more like Lazarus, who is given new life by Jesus, or Martha, who served Jesus, or Mary, who worshiped jesus maybe you're like the crowd observing jesus or the chief priest you're angry and mad at jesus or maybe you're more like the phony judas and you're thinking of how you could use and manipulate jesus to make yourself look better one of the people at the table one of the disciples was john who wrote this And toward the end of this book, toward the end of this gospel, John tells us the reason he wrote the book itself. He says, These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. That's what motivated through the Holy Spirit, the Apostle John, to write this this book, this gospel. It's why he, through the power of the Spirit, recounts this dinner that Jesus was at. 
it is still your lifeline to God today that you would believe in when he says the name of Jesus he he means the person of Jesus so whatever or wherever you find yourself maybe as a outcast or maybe as a busybody or maybe as somebody that is you feel just dead or maybe somebody on the fringes or maybe someone and you think it's too late for you it's never too late if with your heart soul and mind you will come before God and turn from your sin and trust Christ. Peter, another disciple at the table, just a matter of months after this dinner, would stand just a couple of miles away in Jerusalem and speak to a group of people these words, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. The name of Jesus. I wonder if you'd consider him today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this, um, your goodness to us in, in recording in your word this dinner that took place 2,000 years ago. We are thankful for the different people associated and seated around the table and in the room. And we're thankful that like every one of those people, both inside that room and outside that room, we stand in proximity to Jesus Christ. And by standing in proximity to Him, we stand in proximity to You. For Jesus Himself said that when we have seen Him, we have seen You, the Father. God, would You change our hearts from the inside out? Would You transform who we are by placing inside of us new life don't just we're not just asking you to make us better we're asking you to make us new men and new women as we come before you in faith surrendering our lives to you and receiving jesus christ as our lord Father, we pray this of you in his name, the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we're going to close out this service in song as, uh, as we sing and praise him. May the Lord bless you. Thanks. You're the voice of love that's calling There's a chair that waits for you And a friend who understands Everything you're going through But you keep standing at Distance in the shadow of your shade, there's a light of hope that shines. Won't you come and take your place? Bring it all to the table, it's nothing. For all your sin, all your sorrow, and your sadness, there's a Savior ready calls. Bring it all to the table. You can see the weight you carry. Fear that hope.
your sorrow and your sadness There's a Savior ready calls Bring it all to the table Bring it